Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. Today, we're talking about the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1 going pass-fail and what that means for program directors and applicants. I'm joined today by Dr. Daniel Dent, a professor of surgery and medical education at the UT Health San Antonio Long School of Medicine in San Antonio, Texas. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Dent. Um, lots to talk about here, big interest among medical students, this change. Why don't we just start uh, with some basics? When, when did step one uh, officially move to pass fail? So it officially moved to pass-fail on January 26th of this year. So the current MS2, now becoming MS3 class, uh, as they took it, um, if they wanted to take it particularly early, they could still get a numerical score. Uh, but at the timeline where most students across the country take it, it would be pass-fail for that class. And give us a little bit of background on the factors that drove this change. Um, so I think there were a number of factors, and I probably should have mentioned in the first one, Comlex uh, for the osteopathic schools went past fail on May 10th of this year, again, likely affecting the same class of, of students, the uh, applicants for the fall of 23 uh, to match in 24. Um, factors that drove this were a, a combination of things. You know, people worry about teaching to the test versus teaching a more holistic uh, version of medicine. Um, the stress of getting a particular score on a test uh, was a concern. Um, and the, the fact that you spent basically two years in a classroom just cramming for a, a singular uh, exam, uh, as opposed to potentially people looking at your performance across your coursework over two years uh, as a way to evaluate you was viewed as uh, uh, problematic, frankly, to, to look at a singular number. Um, and, uh, and so I think there are a variety of factors that went into um, the, this decision. I should also point out that it's a complex situation where diversity, equity, and inclusion are concerned because uh, there's data that shows that certain uh, racial and ethnic groups don't do as well on standardized tests relative to their actual knowledge. Uh, and so it, it creates an opportunity for uh, discrepancies uh, there. But at the same time, uh, it also could have an anti-DEI effect with regard to uh, students that are not mainstream students from allopathic U.S. medical schools. And so the osteopathic students and the international medical graduates uh, get a chance to distinguish themselves by their test scores. And that may be uh, a move in the wrong direction in terms of uh, DEI issues. We're gonna talk in more detail about that, that idea of distinguishing oneself given this change in a, in a minute. Uh, I'm curious based on what you've heard from kind of uh, those that are gonna be affected by this change. You know, what do folks think about this new, uh, new approach? Well, I thought about this after I was uh, made aware of this would be one of the questions, and I've not heard anything good from anybody, uh, but I also think it's a selection bias um, because people, I only hear what people complain about, uh, for starters, and the other thing is I don't think there's any MS1 or MS2 out there that's saying, oh, thank God my life is so much stressful, uh, less stressful. OK, I, I don't know that, you know, if you didn't go through the previous iteration, I, I don't think you appreciate that there is maybe significantly less stress in your life now because you're not getting a uh, pressure to get a 250 on step one. Um, because first and second year of med school come with plenty of stress uh, and it's hard work. And uh, and so I don't know that people are really, you know, celebrating the uh, the, the lack of a numerical test score. Uh, but at the same time, I think there probably is uh, some of the advantages people saw in making this change are, are coming to fruition, but I don't know that we're hearing about them. I'm, I'm sure change of any kind is difficult for, for, for folks. It's always, uh, I guess, a little sense of uncertainty around it. When you start to kind of play this out in your mind uh, about kind of the future for those that this will impact, how do you, how do you see it 
Uh, how do you see this change impacting uh, the applicants uh, in the coming year and, and programs? Well, as I've talked to program directors, and I am a leader in the surgery program directors organization, but I also uh, am on uh, an organization of program director associations. And so I would speak to program directors from other specialties as well. Um, it's very mixed. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how program directors respond to this. And, and I think what we'll see in that first match without a step one is basically iteration 1.0. And, and it'll be a growth exercise over probably three to five years uh, of adaptation for the, how the program directors look at applicants. And I'm, I'm concerned that in the first iteration, the, the easiest move is just going to be default to step two score. And while maybe looking at some other aspects, looking at grades, looking at clinical rotation grades, maybe... Uh, clinical rotation shelf exam scores, uh, things like that to get a composite of what is this person's medical knowledge and their capacity to attain medical knowledge, because that's really what we're trying to measure with a step one score. Uh, but I think they'll start looking at other aspects of that. I also think other aspects of the application um, will uh, become more important. You know, the uh, letters of recommendation and specifically, do they speak to your medical knowledge? Because right now they mostly speak to, you know, do you work hard and do you get things done? Uh, but they, they don't speak to your medical knowledge all that often as I read through thousands of letter, letters of recommendation every year. And so hopefully we'll start seeing some changes there. Well, Dr. Dent, you just gave a, a really, really great piece of feedback. I want to... Uh, go into this topic, we hear so much from uh, M1s about, especially in this year, about how you distinguish yourself uh, in the residency uh, application process without that score. Now, one thing you just said was, make sure you have re letters of recommendations that speak to your medical knowledge. Uh, and that's an important thing for folks to keep in mind when they ask for those. In this realm of distinguishing yourself, what kind of pieces of advice do you give to, uh, to medical students uh, that they should be thinking about kind of now uh, as they prepare for that future? So I think you need to be able to, you know, demonstrate good acquisition of medical knowledge and your MS3 rotations in particular and your shelf scores on them. Uh, are something that program directors may look at as a substitute for a measure for medical knowledge instead of your step one score. Uh, and realizing that medical knowledge on your MS3 rotations is really what plays into step two score. Uh, but, um, you know, I still think most clinical program directors are going to care more about how you do as a clinician than they do about how you did in some basic science classes. They, they really care about clinical medicine. And so if you can show uh, that you can do well on exams about clinical medicine, uh, that I think will substitute uh, in many program director's eyes for uh, a step one score, because you're gonna be taking tests on clinical medicine for the rest of your life. And in their program, you're gonna have to pass a board exam on clinical medicine in that specialty. And so, Program directors do want to see that. Um, they, they also want to see, like I previously mentioned, the letters of recommendation is, is crucial because ultimately what you're looking for is somebody you want on your team at two o'clock in the morning taking care of a sick person. And having some medical knowledge is part of that, but is by no means the whole, uh, the whole picture. When you're, you're looking at potential applicants, how about extracurriculars? Uh, leadership positions, uh, kind of distinguishing experiences. Where, where does that fall into the mix? So it definitely can be uh, uh, something that we view as a very positive thing. And uh, we look at, for example, the person that has 50 volunteer experiences that were all one hour long. Um, that to us is not as valuable as someone who committed to a volunteer organization and did it 
on their spring break and every summer and ended up in a leadership role in that volunteer organization. And so being selected by your peers and being committed to something uh, through those leadership and, and being rewarded with that through a leadership role is something we value highly. Uh, the other thing we value highly in surgery, uh, team, team sports or team events, orchestra, band, um, cheerleading, whatever, things that where you work in a team and you have success uh, as a member of a team is highly valued. And um, work experiences, and again, kind of like the volunteer experiences, you know, the person that worked 20 different jobs to us makes us wonder why they had to move 20 times. Whereas the person who came back to be, you know, eventually after five summers, the manager at Chili's because they, you know, waited tables as they started out cleaning the place and then they waited tables and then they became a bartender. And then their last summer, they were a manager. Um, that type of experience is something we value highly because we see a, a commitment uh, to an organization and an institution and somebody who through their hard work uh, and uh, how they're viewed by their coworkers ends up earning themselves a, a leadership role. How about participation in organized medicine or health policy, advocacy, things like that? Absolutely. And again, it, it, any of that is viewed positively. I want to make that clear. But significant commitment to it is viewed much more positively. And so if you're the you know, the AMA rep for your school, uh, or uh, you've done other other things within the AMA and have worked with, uh, you know, to do some local volunteer work uh, for the AMA in your community, um, and those sorts of things, whether it's AMA or your state medical association, uh, that is definitely viewed positively as well. But again, there's, there's the people that show up so they can check a box and put it on their CV. And then there's the people that show up and pay attention and commit. And, and that's really who we're looking for. Um, well, that is great advice. Um, I want to follow up on something you spoke about earlier around uh, equity issues. Uh, I think there are potentially concerns about how this change might impact IMGs. Um, or applicants from lesser known medical schools who uh, I guess could have hoped that an outstanding numerical score would have helped them get noticed for an interview. Do you, do you think that this change might put folks like that at a disadvantage and, and uh, what advice would you have for them? Well, I think it has that potential. And you know, if uh, you come from a well-known medical school with letters of recommendation from well-known people, um, and there's nothing else numerical to distinguish you from somebody from a lesser known school with letters from lesser known people. Um, that's a challenge. And, and that, and that was one of the concerns people had about taking away the numerical score of step one. However, you know, ultimately, I guess you can distinguish yourself via step two. Um, many schools uh, have class rank, many don't. Um, you know, in schools that are not just pass fail, but have honors, high pass, pass, or ABC type grading, you can distinguish yourself with those grades. Uh, but there are ways to um, there are ways to distinguish yourself other than step one. And I think step two is probably the default at this point. But there are some other ways that that you can do it. Um, I worry if step two goes away that uh, that would be a real a real challenge for people that are at a disadvantage based on what school they go to uh, with their ability to overcome that. Well, I understand that in addition to the main My Eris application, this year's applicants uh, for both uh, MD and DO programs, including IMGs, are also eligible to complete an optional uh, supplemental application in uh, participating specialties. Can you tell us more about uh, this type of supplemental application and what it would tell a program director and how your institution used it in general surgery? Yes. So um, if I have the number right, I believe 16 specialties participated in this last year uh, with the supplemental application. So it wasn't everybody, but it was half or more of the specialties. Um, and what it does is it gives the program a chance to look for things that would make you a good fit in their program. Because 
while there are more residency positions than there are U.S. grads uh, by 8,000 spots, um, there are not more residency positions than there are applicants when you count the international medical graduates added into the applicant pool. And so as a result, um, we're, you know, I, I heard, first heard about this, I don't know, five years ago, program directors talking about what are we going to do about the problem of too many applicants? Okay, that, that was never viewed as a problem before. Uh, but the reason it's a problem is not because there's too many good people. It's because people are applying to so many programs that we, for example, in San Antonio, get applications from people in the Northeast that we know are extremely unlikely to leave the Northeast if they can have the option of staying in the Northeast for their training or residency training. So what we look for in the supplemental app is something that suggests that maybe they would leave Boston or uh, DC or Philadelphia to come to San Antonio for their training, something that connects them with our Hispanic culture, um, some volunteer work that they've done related to that sort of thing, the fact that they speak Spanish and other things they can put on their uh, supplemental application that would make us then say, you know, while we mostly realize that the people we're going to match are largely going to be from Texas and surrounding states, we might interview the person from Seattle or Boston or Chicago if we see something in their supplemental app that suggests they, they actually might rank us and be happy and want to come to San Antonio. Very interesting. Uh, this is obviously a, uh, you know, a big deal uh, of great interest to medical students out there. Any final thoughts or advice that you'd uh, like to give them? That's a great question. Um, I think that in general, you show up, you work hard, you try your best, you do your best possible on the third year rotations in particular, um, and then listen to the guidance at your school about your application and what you might be competitive for, because nothing to me it is as heartbreaking as someone who got their hopes up and wouldn't listen to the guidance uh, that they got the, you know, you're, you're unlikely to get into orthopedic surgery with your, your resume, your CV, and maybe you should look at another specialty and then they don't do it because they're perfectly good. I'm sorry, a perfectly good applicant for a number of specialties, even though they might not get into one of the Uber competitive ones. And if they recognize that, they can match and they can have a very happy and very productive uh, career and professional life. Um, but when they choose not to, um, that's when we, we struggle as a medical school. We look back at, you know, how did our students do in the match? So, some of those situations are among the, the more frustrating, not, not just for us as educators, but for the individual as well. And so I would encourage students to work with their, their faculty and their dean's office and their guidance to create a good match strategy. Because on match day, you're going to look around and you're going to see somebody that deserve better. And, and it, it's a numerical process that on the whole serves everyone well. But every once in a while, an individual falls through the cracks. And your job is to not be that individual. And if you listen to your mentorship and the guidance on your campus, you can significantly reduce those odds. Dr. Dent, that's just great advice. And just been such an interesting conversation, I'm sure, really valuable to uh, medical students and programs out there. Thanks again for being here today and uh, sharing your perspective with us. Uh, the AMA has a lot of resources to help applicants through the residency application process. And you can begin by visiting frida.ama-assn.org. And Frida is F-R-E-I-D-A. That's frida.ama-assn.org. Uh, to access Frida, our residency and fellowship database that has information on more than 12,000 ACGME accredited programs, as well as resources like our Road to Residency video series. We'll be back soon with another Moving Medicine video and podcast. In the meantime, you can see all of our episodes at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us today, and please take care. Thank you.